words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, O Lord, and our Redeemer. Amen. So I'll begin with an apology to those of you who came to the early show up on the hill by the fort. Uh, you've heard some of this, what you're about to hear already. So you got a little preview of, uh, uh, of what I said earlier, but I felt that some of you needed to hear it again. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll save the other one for later. <laughs> So they were a small group of friends that were gathered together, trying to come to grips with everything that had just happened. Three days ago, their world came crashing around them. And now they're unsure of what they're going to do next. Their friend, their leader, was gone. He had been taken by the authorities in the middle of the night. One of their own had turned against him and turned him in, while another denied even knowing who he was. He was put on trial on trumped up charges and given a death sentence. They watched as the government of the day and the religious leaders who were standing nearby rejoicing. They watched as the death sentence was carried out. They stood there, some of them, not all of them, they stood there and watched him draw his last breath. And then they took him down and they put him in the tomb and they rolled a large stone in front of him. And they thought that was the end. Then came the morning. Everything now was going to be different. When we strip all of this away, when we take all of this away, we take the flowers away, we take the building away, we take all of this away, what we're left with with this day of resurrection is two things. Forgiveness and love. There's a great icon painting called The Harrowing of Hell. Now you have to use your imagination here a bit, but the icon depicts Jesus descending among the dead to rescue those who were there. You see, he, Jesus didn't just come to redeem the living. He came to redeem those who had already died, and in fact, all of creation itself. We see this idea of forgiveness and reconciliation played out in the crucifixion scene itself. There's Jesus hanging on the cross. The death sentence has just been carried out. And there he is hanging there in all of his pain and anguish. And he looks down at the soldiers who are standing there who have just done this to him. And his first thought is to ask God to forgive them. Not so sure that would be my first thought. But his first thought was to ask God to forgive them. And then we see that as you know the story, he was crucified between two thieves, one on his left and one on his right. Hi, Miss O. One on his left and one on his right. This was a final insult, by the way that he was crucified this way. One of them is mocking him. You saved others, save us and yourself. But the other one looks over and asks Jesus for forgiveness. Now, if this was a 21st century scene, right, the person would have to come to church. They'd have to sit down front. By the way, those of you who are in the back, if you want a better seat, there's a couple. <laughs> Always, I always feel very alone up here. <laughs> but the person would have to come to church. They'd have to go through a membership class. They'd have to come for weeks on end, and most importantly, they would have to fill out the pledge card. 
They would have to do all of these things. Or do they? Jesus does not ask a question. He does not inquire the nature of why he's hanging there. He simply turns to him and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. In other words, you are forgiven. But today is also about love. In fact, the entire gospel is about love. Some thinks it's about rules and regulations. Some thinks it's about what we can do to keep other people away. But there was a reason Jesus was crucified the way he was, with his arms open wide. What does this signify? Welcome. Come. But for some places, the door is slammed shut. But the gospel is about love. This is the important thing. And it comes to the point today. Because the ultimate expression of that gospel love is what takes place in the story that we've heard. The love that God has for each one of us. Just the way we are. No. I don't think this can be said enough. Because I think that there's too many people outside the walls that are trying to convince us something else. But the entirety of today, if you take nothing else away from today, the entirety of the message is God loves everybody. He doesn't care what color you are. He doesn't care how tall you are, how short you are, how thin you are, how fat you happen to be, whether you have a lot of hair, whether you have no hair. <laughs> He doesn't care who you love. He doesn't care who you want to marry. He doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't even care if you love him back. He just wants you to know that he loves you so much that Jesus came to show us a new way. Now, I've said this before, and it bears repeating. Jesus came to turn everything on its head. <clears throat> Nothing was the same after all of this story took place. Nothing. He came to change the way we worship. He came to change the way we interact with each other. And he came to change the way we love each other. And this change continued right after his death with his appearance to Mary. Now each of the Gospels tell this story just a little bit differently. The, the, the greatest thing I saw this week, and it was online, so you know it has to be true. The greatest thing I saw this week was the famous Da Vinci painting, right? And there's Jesus and all the and, and the caption is, one of you will betray me, one of you will deny me, and four of you are going to get book deals. <laughs> So we have four very distinct stories about what happened, all told sort of from a different perspective. Like this today, like you're going to go home today and some of you are going to say, it was the greatest thing, the guy that brought the message today was fabulous. <laughs> and then some of you are going to be like, I heard it all. He said the same thing last year. But it comes from different perspectives. And this gospel passage today really isn't even my favorite of the telling of the stories because I don't think it goes deep enough. So I'm going to kind of fill in some blanks here from the other stories. I mean, you all know about those guys. But the men, right, the men, they were all cowering behind locked doors. The other gospels say that they were in the upper room behind the locked door. They were afraid. Rightly so. They didn't know what was going to happen. But the women knew that there was stuff that had to get done. Whether someone was coming for them or not, the women knew that there were just things that had to be done. They couldn't just sit around. Stuff had to get done. Now you remember, Jesus was hastily buried, and the body needed to be prepared for the custom. The custom of burial at the time 
wasn't, didn't happen. So in the other accounts, Mary doesn't go to the tomb by herself. She goes with others. And if you recall, they're trying to figure out after they left the house, how are we going to move the stone? But in this story, it's just Mary. Now she arrives. She finds that the stone is gone. She looks in, and it's empty. So she runs back to tell the men. Now, in the other accounts, Mary's, Mary has already heard that Jesus has risen, and she goes back and she tells the others this. But the men don't believe her. So they all take out their cell phones, and they go to Wikipedia, and they look it up. <laughs> but they don't believe Mary, so they have to go see for themselves. And they set off to find that out. Now, once they get there, they find the tomb is empty. They run. John's Gospel says they run. Peter had to stop partway because he was an older guy. Not <laughs> shame. <laughs> she just laughed at me. That's <laughs> but they get there and they find the tombs empty, and what do they do? They just go home. They just go home. But Mary stays. She needs to figure this out. Then Jesus appears to her. Well, she thinks it's the garden first. Because who wouldn't, right? You're in a garden, and all of a sudden, there's a guy there. So you think it's the garden. So she asks him, what have you done? I'll go get him and bring him back. Just tell me where you put him. But she doesn't recognize Jesus until he says her name. And then recognition appears. gives her a job to do. And that job is to preach, to go, tell, inform, make sure everybody knows what's happening here. And this was just the beginning. While the men were cowering, the women were doing what had to be done. Now Jesus took this complex system of rules and regulations and he boiled it down to two very important things. Love God, love everybody. There's a theme here, if you haven't noticed. This love of everyone includes those that don't love you back. Now I want to do this little exercise. I've done this before. I did it this morning at the Sunrise Service Club. No. I want you to get comfortable no. if you can. Get yourself, you know, we have the nice pants. That means I can preach longer, by the way. <laughs> so if you feel comfortable enough, close your eyes for a moment. Don't nod off, just close your eyes. And I want you to think about the most despicable person that you can think about. The person that makes your blood boil when you hear their voice or even see their face. Everybody have this person in mind? Some of you perhaps have more than one. <laughs> That's the person that we are commanded to love. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> not easy. Not easy. And it's not going to happen overnight. But it's something that we have to work on. We are a work in progress, all of us. But that's the person that we're supposed to love. On Friday, as I was preparing for our Good Friday service, I came across something else online. So, you know, again. And this is what it said. And this is very poignant. When you learn how to sit at the table with your Judas, you will understand the love of Christ. When you learn to sit at the table with your Judas, then you will understand the love of Christ. Jesus knew full well what was going to happen. But yet there was Judas at the table with the other eleven. Welcomed to be there. That's the goal. It'd be nice to say we were all there, right? It'd be nice to say, oh, I can do that. That's easy. <laughs> 
It really isn't, right? In a few moments, we're going to spiritually gather around this table here in the center of the church. This is not a table of sacrifice. This is a table of love. This is the table where we will share a meal that will spiritually nourish us and help us to carry out those commands to love. This is an open table. It's open and available to all who desire to come. This meal that we serve is a healing meal, not some prize because we checked off enough boxes on a sheet, but it is designed to be a healing meal and a moment of grace together. The food we offer is available to everyone even if you're not ready to love everyone. The beauty of what Christ did for us on this day is that he did it for everyone. Even those who put him there. Even those who were next to him. Even those who denied him. Betrayed him. Deserted him at the last minute. He did it for everyone. His arms were open wide to receive all. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So I invite you. I invite you to come as you are. I invite you to come as a redeemed and a forgiven people. I invite you to come to the empty tomb. And I invite you to come to the table. The invitation is to come just as you are. But the idea is that we leave changed.